Good evening, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for tuning in to our Pint of Science event. Uh, this is day one of our festival, and I'm Petra, and I will be your host for tonight. The topic of tonight is oceans and climate change. Before we dive into our topic, though, let me introduce the organization behind this event first. Um, give me a second, and here we go. Wonderful. Pint of Science is a community of uh, scientists uh, that was born in the UK in 2013. And our main mission is to bring scientists to, out of the ivory tower, where they usually strive, to where the people really are in pubs and cafes, so that we can uh, see if the scientists and their ideas are really able to pass the pub talk. Since its very beginning, the festival has grown almost exponentially, leading to thousands of researchers across 24 countries and 400 cities coming together in May 2019 to share their science in a public space. The pandemic, however, moved our events to an online forum in 2020, which was also the year that Norway as a country joined the wonderful community of Pint of Science. Our national pint is brewed from one central team and several local chapters to hold the main event. Pint of Science Festival uh, happens locally in, Norwegian's in Norwegian towns and cities. And you can find us on all social media at uh, handle Pint of Science and all, or you can decide to contact us directly on our website, pintofscience.no where you can also subscribe to our newsletter uh, so that you are up to date with our events. Please decide to follow us so that you are also up to date with uh, the, the adventures of our mascot, Barney, uh, and all our special events that we organize on top of annual Pint of Science Festival. Our events uh, usually cover the topics of uh, beautiful mind, Planet Earth, our society, our body, take me out, atoms to galaxies, and our additional events cover some extra topics, like the recent uh, event, Demystify AI, that was organized by our director, Tibor. Um, our concept is uh, pretty straightforward, as I said, we like to bring the scientists to where the people really are, to places like uh, pubs, cafes, and bars, uh, where all of us get to interact in a free and laid back manner. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to return to such spaces next year. This year, however, uh, we have to we had to bring the speakers to an online platform. Uh, our speakers like to interact with uh, our audience, so uh, please, for all of us uh, watching, uh, our speakers like to interact with uh, our audience, that. so if you are watching us online right now, uh, let us know in the comments on YouTube, and let's get the atmosphere going. Um, let me bring the slides back. All of this is organized by our amazing volunteers uh, who are dedicated and driven to make science accessible to everyone. Our, vo our volunteers also strive to make evening more fun by designing games on uh, nights of the events that are usually uh, revolving around the topic of the night. And tonight we'll try to recreate that atmosphere and spirit the best way we can by inviting you to play these games online. So if you are watching our stream on YouTube, 
uh, and you would prefer to continue playing the game with your browser, please go to website kahoot.it. Otherwise, you can decide to use your smartphone, have it handy right next to you so you can um, play the game that we, prepared, that we prepared for you tonight. Um, and the best part of our concept is that we uh, stay connected to the worldwide principle and while attending our festival you can feel the atmosphere of uh, of the uh, experience that science brings locally however you still are connected to people experiencing the same amazement uh, by science and discoveries all around the world. These are the photos from previous festivals happening in Mexico, France, uh, UK, US, Russia, Australia. And what's in it for you is of course the fun that uh, sharing the joy of discoveries brings. You get to ask the questions to our speakers and likewise our uh, speakers get to uh, experience the feedback from public directly. As a speaker, you receive advice and skill training to present your message and research to a different audience. And you get to be in the spotlight and get exposure to uh, family, friends and colleagues uh, who you invite to these events. But most importantly, we like to have fun together. And none of this would be possible without our sponsors, uh, Akademiet for Ingre Forschner, Simula, the Nansen Legacy, and the uh, Filamo organization that is sponsoring uh, event tonight. Um, that is all from me. And now I would like to invite you for a short um, energizing event. Let us know on YouTube if you manage to access uh, the Kahoot app in your app store or if you are uh, connecting online. We will post the link in the chat. And you can go to this website where we prepare the ice breaking quiz for you today that I will share shortly. So now you see the code on the Kahoot website here. And if you are playing on a browser or on the Kahoot app, this is the time when you log in to the game with the, the pin code that you see on your screen. And you register your name there uh, so that we can actually see who won the quiz. Seems like we already have four players going. That is great. Let's wait a little bit longer so that we get a nice competition going on. I think we are slowly ready. Let's start the let's start the game then. So 
So now, people, are you ready for question one? Hopefully you have your smartphones ready or your touchpads ready. Seven seconds left to answer this question. Are we ready to kick off Pint of Science Festival 2021 in Bergen? Looks like most of us are. And no one is getting another drink. <laughs> okay. Tell us where are you watching our festival, please? Since uh, we moved this event online, we are wondering whether we have a local audience only or whether we are really connected globally. Let us know where you're watching Pint of Science from. 12 seconds left. There seems to be a major answer. Hopefully Bergen audience is uh, going strong. <laughs> Oh, oh, nice. We have a Bergen audience, someone from Naples watching. Hello to Italy. Hello to Oslo as well. We are with you. <laughs> and there's a weird answer, HJ, and I have really no clue if that's a real acronym of a city. But if you know, please do let us know in the comments in YouTube. But let's get ready for our final question of the Energizer. What drink did you bring for tonight? And again, you have 20 seconds. If you don't have any drink yet, please get yourself a drink. This event is all about combining the things we like. And in this case, it's science and nice drinks. I'm only on uh, mint tea tonight <laughs> so that we can kick off this event properly. And looks like most of you are enjoying your beers. Tease, what is wrong with this uh, ugly, <laughs> sad face here? Margarita, nice. Cheers. Aperol spritz and hard water. Very good. Looks like we are all ready to kick off our second Pint of Science Festival in Norway. The winner of the icebreaker is Kat. Congrats, Kat. You were the fastest and uh, you had the best answers to our energizing event. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker of the day for the topic oceans and climate change. Our speaker is um, Joanna Mirset Arflot, and she's right here with me. Welcome, Joanna. Thank you, Petra. And thank you for the Pint of Science team for giving me this opportunity to talk about my favorite animals. If we also can get my presentation up on the screen, that would be great. Okay. So my favorite animals are often referred to as the insects of the sea. And let me see. The topic today of my talk is copepods, which is also called hoppekreps in Norwegian. And I aim to show you both what I personally find so fascinating about these creatures, why they are important for the ecosystems, and also how they may be affected by a warmer ocean climate. Copepods are tiny organisms between around one millimeter uh, large, uh, and you need a microscope to really uh, study them. But even though they are tiny, they are also the strongest animals in the world. 
because when you are this small, the water becomes a very viscous and a thick medium to move around in. So it's heavy to be a copper pot in water, comparable to if we as humans were swimming around in sticky syrup. Now, these organisms have an amazing ability to jump away from an approaching predator. In this video, the siphon you see at the bottom, this uh, generates a drag through the water, and this is uh, then a simulation of an approaching fish predator. And you can see the copper pod that when it gets too close to uh, this drag, it jumps away and at an amazing um, distance. It has been estimated that they can accelerate and jump at a speed that represents a movement of several hundred body lengths per second. And for them, this requires a force that is 10 times greater than what has ever been estimated for another animal or even human-made motors. Now, if we look at their escape response in slow motion, it's evident that it's not necessarily easy for the fish to catch this prey, despite the size difference between the two. But copepods are um, blind, they don't have eyes. And so one might wonder how are they able to actually sense an approaching predator and respond to this? And the answer lies in a set of fine hair that you can see on, the, um, on their antenna here. These hair are bent when the fish is swimming uh, through the water. This generates uh, a movement of the water that bends the hairs, and this allows the copepods to uh, react to, to uh, sense the approaching danger and react to it. So I mentioned that copepods are tiny, and you would actually need close to two billion copepods to match the weight of an average human being of 62 kilograms. But if we look at the, um, if we compare the total biomass on the planet of copepods compared to the total biomass of humans, we actually have 150 times more weight of copepods compared to the total weight of the human population. And this is because the copepods are extremely abundant. They are, in fact, the most abundant multicellular organisms on Earth. But their high abundance is not the only reason for why they are so important for the ecosystem. They also contain something which the rest of the ecosystem relies on, oil. The beautiful oil sac is highly visible when you view these organisms through a microscope. And in fact, it may comprise over half of the total weight of these creatures. So we often say that copepods have a key role in the food web. <clears throat> so at the bottom of the marine food chain, you have phytoplankton that use nutrients and light to grow. The copepods, they feed on this phytoplankton. And in doing so, they are basically converting these algae, which you might consider uh, as a type of grass, into a lipid-rich food source that the rest of the ecosystem can um, utilize. So these, uh, these creatures are a key food source for both fish larvae, here we see a cod larvae, uh, for um, pelagic fish like herring, they are very important for or many types of seabirds and also for some marine mammals that also have these tiny creatures as a central component of their diet. So in addition to being highly abundant, they have a key role because they convert low energy carbohydrates and, and proteins into high energy lipids that the rest of or, or the, that supports the production of organisms that are higher up in the food chain. 
Now, copepods are faced with a dilemma. The phytoplankton food that they want grow in the surface water where there is light, but this is also where, where they are more vulnerable to being eaten by fish and other predators that use the vision to find their food. Deep waters are darker and also therefore more safe for the copepods, but unfortunately there is little food there. Now, they have solved this dilemma by moving up and down in the water column, and this effectively enhances their chance of survival. In hours when there is daylight, they remain at deep depths where there is less light, and then they move up to the surface during the night to feed. And when the daylight returns, they go back into the deeper and darker uh, layers of the ocean. At our latitudes, uh, so here in Norway and also further north, they also perform these types of migrations on a seasonal basis. So here they spend uh, spring and summer within the top 200 meters of the ocean. And then in late summer, they swim down to between 500 to 1,000 meters depth to uh, where they enter a resting phase, a kind of uh, hibernation that lasts until the following spring. Now, this is a very clever strategy because there isn't much food available in the surface during autumn and winter of our latitudes. And in the deep, it's dark and there are few predators around, so they have a greater chance to survive and reproduce the next spring. One thing that continues to puzzle me is how they can know when they are residing at a thousand meters depth that spring has returned and there is food available again in the surface. <clears throat> it's been estimated that they move at a speed of one meter per hour during these movements uh, or during the seasonal migrations as we call them up and down. And this means that they would need to start swimming up towards the surface around one month before the food actually blooms. And the timing here is critical because if they arrive too early or too late, they would struggle to get enough food for themselves and their offspring. When they do return to the surface, they arrive in such quantities that the sea may literally be colored in red creating a feeding frenzy for hungry fish. Here you see a herring feeding on a cloud of Colonus finmarchicus, Rauota. This is the most common type of copepods in Norwegian waters. And the quantities may in fact be so high that the color can be detected by satellite images from space. Now, copepods are marine plankton, and this means that they are transported around with the ocean currents. They have short life cycles of around a year or two, and their growth is tightly linked to the ocean temperature. We therefore expect that these types of organisms will be the first to respond to a changing ocean climate. Now, due to their central position in this food web, uh, it's also so that any changes that affect these species, the copepods, may potentially spread through the whole system and affect multiple types of organisms on, on many different levels. In a future warmer ocean, we expect that the timing of seasonal events might change. We might, for instance, see that the spring uh, phytoplankton bloom, which is the food for the copepods, that it will occur earlier in the future than what it does today. And this may, might lead to a mismatch in the timing of when the copepods come up to the surface to feed uh, after hibernating in the deep and when their food is actually available. 
Now, the average size in the copepod communities may also be affected by a warmer climate. These organisms grow faster at warmer temperature, and communities in warmer parts of the ocean today have smaller average sizes than the more poleward communities that we find in, in Norwegian waters. And this can at least partly be linked to uh, temperature. So there is a concern both that the indiv individual species may have uh, smaller sizes in the future, but probably more likely that the smaller and faster growing species from warmer latitudes may expand their ranges northwards and outcompete the larger species in a warmer ocean. And this is important because large sizes contain more fat and are more valuable prey for fish and others that feed on them. And how copepods will be affected by a warmer ocean climate is central to my own research in the, at the Institute of Marine Research and in the Nansen Legacy Project. Okay, so I will end my talk with a fantastic picture which I've carelessly stolen from the internet and which shows all the life that is present in a single drop of seawater. In my view, these organisms hold the key to how life in the ocean will respond to and adapt to a changing climate. Thank you for listening. Wonderful and fascinating. Thank you so much, Joanna. That was just uh, fascinating. So uh, heads off for uh, using this picture <laughs> and uh, beautiful images. So you mentioned that the, the sizes of copy pods uh, differ a lot throughout the year. What is the biggest one you've ever seen? Uh, the biggest one I've ever seen was about five millimeters large, which is which is big. I mean, it's a massive difference between the normal or massively larger than the normal sizes. Hmm. That's uh, really massive. Uh, mm. Also, uh, you mentioned that the copper pots spend the uh, winter in deep waters, right? Yeah. Uh, down to up to one kilometer, as far as I heard you correctly. Yeah, actually, there are some that also go deeper down to 2,600 kilometers or 2,600 meters depth. They really like to dive in, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any idea of what cue they use to know that spring is on its way when it's getting warmer and they start to swim up? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the key questions we need to understand to, to be able to predict how they will be affected by warmer ocean climate. And there are many different views on this, so we don't have a very clear answer, but I think uh, in general, one can say that it, part of it is like an evolutionary adaptation, right? So those who go down at the optimum time and come up at an optimum time are the ones that produce the most offspring and therefore the ones that we find today compared to for many, many years ago. Um, but now there are also recent uh, data or recent uh, analysis that indicate that there might be something in the DNA, in fact. So they have found some uh, type of uh, clock genes that may have a role in turning on and off this kind of response. Oh, wow. So that's like inscribed watch. That's wonderful. Hmm. Ah, it seems like we have a question from YouTube as well. Um, do you know if copy pots are uh, so little, we can only see them under microscope. Uh, and what methods are used to follow them in the ocean? Can you actually follow them in the ocean, their movements? Very, very good question. Um, so what we do, it's not so easy to study them actually in the ocean. What, what has been normally done is that you use some type of net that you lower down in the water and then you take it back up and you, you filter basically a certain part of the water. But you can't go down to thousands of meters of depth 
with these nets. So what happens in the deep, it, it's a different question. And in recent years, there have been some uh, dives with ROVs, so underwater uh, vehicles that uh, go around and take a video. And they have gone down to really deep depths with these and found dense aggregation of, of these copper pods, which is very uh, fascinating. But mm. I personally actually use models to study them. And with the models, we can actually follow them with the currents because you have you have some physical models. It kind of, it's in the same group as weather forecasting. Weather forecasting is a little bit more precise, but the physical models are pretty good. And they uh, there you basically have where the, the main currents are going. And then you can add kind of a particle to this and you can follow this around the sea. And th that's how I currently study them. That sounds like a very efficient method to study their movements in the... <laughs> so I can easier imagine. than going out to the sea. <laughs> I can imagine it would have been very exhausting to go out <laughs> all the time. Um, Let's see if we have any other question on uh, YouTube. Just uh, to remind our audience, you can ask any uh, questions at any point throughout the talks in the YouTube chat, and then uh, we will ask our speakers. Uh, Joanna, you also mentioned that uh, they can actually um, transform the fat into something else. Is that correct? Uh, no, so what I meant to say is that, so they basically convert salad into cheeseburgers. That's what they do. They eat oh, wow. grass and then they create something that is full of fat. And this is what the rest of the ecosystem needs. So the fish and everything else can't eat kind of the small grass that is just floating there. But the copper pots can, so they eat this. And due to this, you have everything else on top, even mammals that feed on these because they are so full of fat. So that's kind of uh, one of the traits or uh, one of the marks how you're able to identify them, right? The presence of this uh, lipid uh, inside of them? Or? Yeah, and also they have quite characteristic uh, body shape, but uh, right. it's, it's not necessarily so easy to distinguish between the species. Uh, Do they I mean, look the same throughout their yeah. lifestyle? Uh, uh, well, they they do change a bit, but but little. Uh, I mean, well, they change from going from what is called like a nauplie, which is like the, the very 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 tiny ones, uh, to kind of like kindergartenish, <laughs> few days old, and then you have the ones that are weeks old that are really adult and. Uh, yeah, there's a small change there, but but they look very much the same. And this is also fascinating because it means that they have a very efficient uh, kind of body shape because they are so successful in the ocean. It means that they have done something right with regards yeah. to how they look. Yeah, I guess so. Thank you so much, Joanna. I think uh, now we need to move on to our next speaker. Uh, you can find out more about Joanna's research on the website that we will post to the chat on YouTube. And if you have any other questions for Joanna, stick around for a final wrap up of uh, questions and answers session after our last speaker of tonight. Thanks again, Joanna. Virtual applause. And now let me invite our second speaker, Professor, pa Professor Particle, to the stage. Um, he goes by name Professor Particle, but the real name of our second speaker is Richard Sanders, and I will let him introduce himself. Sorry, Richard, it seems like you are muted. Uh, yeah, you have to switch on your audio.
and we still cannot hear you, but uh, let's work this out. Is that better? Yes. Now it works. Wonderful. There's a bit of echo in the background, but I think you have it covered. Is that better now? Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Now the audio is clear. Okay. And take it away. Is that working? Uh, I think you should go to the. Uh, I think you should go to the next speaker. Can you do that? Yes, uh, we can uh, leave you for the last speaker of the night while you are. Oops, solving out your audio issues. In this case, we will move on to our next speaker, uh, Petra Langebroek. Hello, Petra. Hello. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Uh, welcome and take it away. Thank you. Um, so I, can you let me know if you see my screen now as well? Yes, we can see your screen. OK. Work. Thanks a lot. So um, I'm. I hope you're enjoying the Pint of Science uh, events uh, so far. Um, I will take you out of the ocean, but onto land, and to be more precise, onto the Greenland ice sheet. So in this uh, next 15 minutes or so, I will show you lots of uh, photos of, uh, of how it is to live and to do research in a camp in the middle of the Greenland ice sheet. So my name is Petra Langebroek. I work at NORS and at the Bjergne Center for Climate Research. So, but first of all, why do we study ice sheets? Um, they are beautiful and they are a very pristine environments, but also actually they might affect a lot of people living on the coastal, in the coastal areas. So at present, we have two ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet in the north and the Antarctic ice sheet in the south. And if the Greenland ice sheet would melt entirely, so really completely, sea level would rise by seven meters. Uh, the Antarctic ice sheet is even larger. So if the Antarctic ice sheet would um, totally melt away, global mean sea level would rise by 60 meters. So now don't start worrying. This is not going to happen today or tomorrow, but we do see sea level rise. And for the end of the century, um, it's predicted that sea level will rise by maybe up to, to one meter. If we look at a little bit longer time scale, so let's say in 200 years or so, we might even have a sea level that is three meters higher than it is today. So um, you might see that there's a big um, gap between the numbers that I have here in the table. And that is because we don't really know uh, how climate will change in the future. And that depends a lot on what climate um, emission scenarios we all are following. So if we manage to reduce our carbon dioxide uh, emissions, then hopefully we can stay on these lower numbers. Um, so maybe we should just try to all do that, um, uh, especially for, for cities on the coast. Uh, these numbers are very worrying. And uh, for myself, I'm from the Netherlands, so which is a country that's mostly below its present sea level. So uh, it's uh, important uh, to study how sea level will rise in the future. Of course, sea level is not only uh, due to melting of ice sheets. Um, there is also uh, about maybe 50% of it or so is, is due to the warming of the ocean. So when the ocean gets warmer, it expands and sea level also rises. And a large part is also due to the melting of uh, glaciers that are not counted into this ice sheet component. 
Okay, so normally my my work uh, in my work I, I study the interactions between ice sheets and the rest of the climate, so the atmosphere and the ocean, and I do that with computer models. So I'm using physical and mathematical representations of of processes that are going on in the real world. So I mostly sit in my office behind my computer or nowadays at my home office. But two years ago, I had this really nice opportunity to go here, middle of, of Greenland and join the East Grip project. So the East Greenland Ice Core project. And today in the next 10 minutes, I will show you pictures from, from that. So here, here you see an overview of, of basically the more or less the whole camp. So when I was going to, to East Grip, um, I, I was a little bit worried and I didn't really know what was going to happen. And the same for my family. So I have two small boys here and this picture is taken just after I came back. So here they are four and six years old. And they were asking me all these questions. Mama, how will you go there? Well, where will you sleep? And what will you do there? And to be honest, because I never went to Greenland before, I didn't really know. So I couldn't give them all the answers uh, they wanted to. So I decided to bring two of their friends, two Lego friends, uh, to the East Grip camp and take lots of photos with them to explain how I'm doing there and how scientists live there and what kind of research we're actually doing there. So I will show you photos from, from this um, picture collage. But if you're interested in see, reading the whole story, you can just scan the QR code here, and then you will see the entire story on the website. So East Grip is located really in central North Greenland. And why are we actually interested in that region? Well, this map shows velocities of the ice, so how quick the ice is flowing for the northern part of Greenland. And the more red or even white the colors are, the higher the velocities. So in central Greenland, uh, the ice is hardly flowing at all, but in these uh, reddish parts uh, are indicated ice streams, so the fast flowing parts of the ice sheet. And East Grip is located at the start of one of these ice streams, and the camp itself moves about one meter per week in the north, north, northeast direction. So basically closer to Europe. That's about uh, 51 uh, meters per year. And that's pretty fast for being so far into inland, in the, close to the center of the ice sheet. So that's why we'll go there and study the ice. Um, but how do we actually go there? So this one was a favorite for my kids. We go with a military plane. So first from Bergen, you go to Denmark and from Denmark to Kangaluswak uh, in normal passenger planes. But then in Kangaluswak, uh, we hopped onto this military plane that is specially designed to, to, to go on normal runways like you see here, but also to land and to take off from the ice like you can see here. So in the center of the ice sheet, um, it, it is a big mountain basically, an ice sheet, but at the center, it's really, really flat. So um, it's a perfect place for such a plane to, to land and to take off. Inside the plane, it's also not like a normal passenger plane with stewardesses and everything. No, it's really quite um, messy maybe. You have to sit uh, on kind of benches on the side. You can see here also all the luggage that we're bringing. In the back, there's a huge pallet with all our, our, our clothes and, and also food that we brought for that trip. So this is a picture of the main street of the camp. So the main street has always the flags uh, there and the flags indicate uh, either the participating countries of the Eastwood project, but also the nationalities of the people that are at the camp. So the first flag here, the, the Dutch flag, is because me and actually another Dutch person were at the camp at that time. This is the main structure of the camp, and I would maybe call it home, but it's called the dome. 
Uh, this is where uh, we we uh, we have meetings, where we have briefings, where we have uh, our food, and also our relaxed space. And most importantly, it's warm inside. Um, but the dome itself is not big enough to host all the participants in a field campaign. So uh, we were around 30 to 40 people at the same time, and uh, we were all sleeping in tents. And these kind of these tents are called weather ports, and you can see one of them here. So inside there is a wooden floor, and there are bunk beds. There is even a little radiator, which is really nice because. Even with the radiator, it's close to freezing at night. So also you can see here that we have warm sleeping bags and uh, some towels to, to protect ourselves a little bit against the light. So what do we actually do in eScrip? Now we do lots of measurements uh, on the surface, but the main goal is to drill an ice core. And um, by drilling an ice core, it means that you go vertically through the ice and you take pieces of ice up. And then we do lots of measurements on these, on these ice pieces of ice. And uh, this is important and it shows us uh, the climate of the past. And the way this works is that um, each time it snows, the snow uh, forms a new layer on top of each other. And these layers, they are converted into to ice when, when they are compacted by the new layers. But the original layers keep the climate information saved basically in the mono, mono, molecules, in the isotopic composition of that, of that snow. So when we drill an ice core deeper and deeper into the ice, we basically uh, uh, drill an archive going to, to older uh, times and older climates. So this drilling of this of this ice core is not done on the surface because uh, in the summer on the surface it can actually get quite warm and the direct sunlight would would ruin the measurements of the ice that we're bringing up. So most most of the um, uh, analysis and also the drilling itself is done below the below the snow, and for this a special cave basically is made and now I, I will take you into that that cave so you can come along with me there is like a tunnel where we go through you don't have to bow your head or so you can just walk it's big enough and then there are several trenches below the ice that look like this so this is the biggest one where we do most of our analysis uh, but there is also there are also several other ones where we store the ice cores, for example, or where we drill the ice. So the ice cores themselves, they look something like this. Um, and then we do uh, several cuts of that and uh, initial measurements. We take uh, um, notations or if we see special layers in there. And most of all, we cut it in smaller pieces and wrap them up. Uh, write the specific numbers on there so that we know where this ice comes from. And then on our way out of the camp, we bring all these pieces of ice back to the different lab laboratories all around the world where further analysis are, are being done. So one of my tasks was to cut the ice in even smaller pieces. So this is one of the machines that I was using for that. It's basically like a saw that you would use uh, uh, when you were cutting or carving wood. And unfortunately, this picture is uh, not so very sharp. I'm sorry for that, but maybe you can see that there is a ruler here and a small stick of ice. And uh, so one of my other tasks was to measure exactly how long that ice was on the millimeter and to clean it a little bit. And then we were going to melt this. This sounds very counterintuitive that you're first drilling ice and then you're melting it, but we only were melting this small piece and we did it for a very good reason. Because in, the, in our measurements, um, uh, you can see the machinery here on the right side, uh, we take uh, oxygen isotope uh, an analysis. And these oxygen isotopes, they actually tell us something about how the climate was in the past 
and they also help with um, defining how old the pieces of ice were. So on the left, you can see me standing next to the other machine we were using. Uh, here we put the ice stick in and let it slowly melt. And then with the laser, we calculate exactly, or we show this exactly how far we are in the melting. So actually then we know how deep we are in the ice, in the, in the ice core. So how deep we are in the original ice. So this depth measurement together with the isotopes is, is really a base for uh, all the further analysis. But this machinery uh, includes some computers and computers, they generate heat and we were below in this ice cave. So in order to keep that heat from melting the entire trench, uh, we were actually working in a container inside this ice trench. So I was in a slightly warmer spot when I was doing those kind of measurements. But when we were working in the cave, in the trench here ourselves, temperatures are close to or are around minus 18. Uh, so you had to really dress up well. And every two hours we were going on a compulsory break to get warm again. So then we would go back to the uh, entrance or to the exit. Not, we had to remember to, to bring our, uh, put our uh, sunglasses on because in the summer in East Crip, it's always light. So you were always a bit blinded by the light. And then we would go back to the dome, drink a warm coffee or a tea to warm up again. So these are some pictures of how it looks inside of the dome. So on the ground floor, there is a kitchen and a, and a space where we can have dinner. And on the first floor, there are some couches to, to relax in the evenings and uh, also it's often to do a little bit of work there in the warm dome. So I want to finish with some of maybe the more funny uh, photos. So um, if you had to go to the toilet, you had to do that outside in a tent. So this is one of our five, I think, five uh, toilet tents. So inside it looks like a basically a hole in the ice <laughs> and uh, outside we had the tent and um, the flag in front indicated if the tent if the toilet was busy so on the left here the toilet was busy and here there was the toilet was free okay i hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, tour in uh, in east Grip. and uh, i would like to give you these uh, few take home messages so if the entire Greenland ice sheet would melt, that would cause a sea level rise of, of seven meters globally. Um, so we study uh, the ice sheets and the climate interactions uh, by going to these kind of remote camps and do lots of measurements. Um, East Grip camp itself moves quite fast. So it moves one meter per week, the ice below the East Grip camp. And unfortunately, we still don't really know why because we have not uh, reached the bottom of the drilling yet. So with this, I would say thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Petra. This uh, really does sound like a story of a lifetime to tell to your grandkids. <laughs> yes. um, let me just uh, ask you right away, do you feel like you were trained for this kind of mission? <laughs> <laughs> uh, on one hand, yes, because actually we, for safety reasons, we really had to do several trainings. So um, we went to uh, Folgefona to do a glacier course. So how to walk on snow and all of that. Maybe it was even um, more extreme than, than being in camp because in the camp it's all very flat and there are no crevasses so we would not worry about falling in the ice or something like that. So we had the training. We even had also a shooting training in case an ice uh, polar bear would come which is not very realistic but it has happened so we had to be, be trained for that as well. But on the other hand I don't think I was very trained to be in such a remote place but being there is is extremely special it's it's really uh, beautiful 
and it's very nice to be so focused on research for a while and to really work on on getting this amazing data out yeah that really sounds like uh, it was worth it so are you still working on the data that you um, collected during this trip back then yeah so to be honest i was more like a helper <laughs> so uh, i'm not the main person that works directly with the data so like i said in the beginning i'm working more with computer models but um on on a, on a different level we, i would use that data when it's published when it's all out to to compare my simulations to yeah but i'm not the person who is interpreting the analysis uh myself sounds like uh, these models are really useful thing to <laughs> use in your research for yeah. sure uh, we have a question from YouTube here uh, how deep can the drilling potentially go and yeah. are there polar bears there yeah two questions yeah so East Grip camp is about uh, 2700 meters above sea level uh, and the ice sheet itself is almost the same thickness. So we're trying to, to drill to the bottom, but we are not really there yet because it's so deep that it takes a long time to, for the drill to go in and then bring ice up and then go in, back in again. So it, it, the campaign was planned to happen over uh, three or four years. Um, Unfortunately, this year and also last year, uh, there was a break because of COVID. So it was too difficult to get these military planes there and to get the right people in, in place. Uh, so um, hopefully next year we can go back. And then I really hope um, that my colleagues, I, I don't think I will go back, but that my colleagues will reach, uh, reach the bottom. Yeah, so about almost 3000 uh, meters thick. Uh, and the polar bear question so um normally you wouldn't expect any polar bears there because it's so far inland so uh in the beginning when they settled the camp they really didn't expect a polar bear would come there but there have have been uh a, a few luckily not in my seasons or not in the summer two years ago but the year before there was a polar bear yeah and a hypothetical if you encountered one would it be completely up to you <laughs> to face him or uh, yes. is there someone skilled yeah there are people that are way more skilled than me but but part of our training was also to prepare for that so we did get for example shooting lessons right. but we were not walking around with guns we didn't need that because there was also a radar system and uh yeah people that were were, were looking out for for polar bears so luckily we didn't have to carry guns but there were there were a few in camp in case a polar bear would appear yeah well it's better to be prepared i guess <laughs> yeah um there are several more questions about uh, what it's like uh to live at the station and about eating cooking and going to the bathroom which uh, <laughs> you covered partially uh, and we posted the link to Petra's Lego story in our YouTube chat, so you can find out more about it there. Uh, thank you so much, Petra. I really enjoyed this uh, experience. Thank, thank you, you for sharing it with us. Thank you for the opportunity. And now we will uh, move on to our final speaker of the day, Professor Particle with hopefully no audio issues now. Hello, Professor. Professors make mistakes too, I guess. <laughs> uh, we cannot hear you yet. No, still nothing. Hello. Yes, now we can hear you. Hello. Hello. Right. All good. All good now. Hello, everybody, Thanks. and sorry for that. Uh, for that. Um, for that uh, temporary hiatus. Uh, um, it's very nice to be here, and um, 
My name is Professor Particle uh, in the evening when I do science outreach and uh, during the day my name is Richard Sanders and I work at Norse which is in Bergen. Uh, so I'm a biological oceanographer at some stages and um, but I'm here today in my pub to tell you something about uh, all the work that we do around sinking particles in the open ocean. So is it possible to show the slides please? Thank you so much. So um, my, my title's uh, all about sinking or swimming, and it's about particles in the ocean. So let's see if we can make this work. So um, by sheer chance, we didn't rehearse this earlier, but it's a great intro. Thank you very much to the, the first speaker. Um, this is, as, uh, as she said, a photograph down a microscope of all the organisms that are living in a single drop of seawater. And so that's a, a pretty amazing picture. We can see lots of different sorts of organisms. We can see uh, uh, some copepods that we discussed earlier. We can see some uh, diatoms here. These are phytoplankton. So these are cells, little plants that grow in the surface ocean, um, photosynthesizing, taking up carbon from the atmosphere and turning it into food that these copepods can eat. Um, so uh, that's what one centimeter of water looks like. This is what the world looks like if you look at it from a really, really big scale zoomed out. Uh, and so the, these colours here are where there's lots and lots of these phytoplankton, lots of biological activity. And these areas here are where there's not so much. Um, and there's lots and lots of complicated reasons why these areas don't have so much. And these areas have a lot. Um, it's mainly to do with marine physics. Uh, so these areas are the nutrient supply. So this is nice and warm here. So uh, the ocean's very, very hot in the surface and a bit colder in the interior. And so the things that plants need to grow can't mix into the surface ocean very easily. Um, but uh, that, that sort of ecosystem, as we call it, all the phytoplankton and zooplankton, uh, we've got little pictures of them here. So there's some phytoplankton in the surface ocean, and here's some zooplankton eating. Uh, this surface ecosystem um, works together to, uh, to regulate our climate. And what happens is these zooplankton here are eating these phytoplankton. So these are the uh, the cows of the sea eating the grass of the sea and they're producing uh, these what we call aggregates um, that, that uh, sometimes they clump together and they sink down and as they sink down they take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere up here and transfer it into the ocean and these organisms uh, although they're small they're mighty they can regulate the composition of our atmosphere uh, what our climate is like and so as well as providing food to eat they're also regulating the composition of our atmosphere by their actions. So they're pretty important. Every day, all day, out there in the oceans, these organisms are doing their thing. They're keeping our climate the way it is, and um, we don't even think about them very much, um, but they're doing it, and uh, it's pretty important. Here's some vertical migration that was discussed earlier, and um, so this is the marine food web. And so one question that we think about quite a lot in uh, the sort of work that I do is, how important are these ocean particles? Um, so uh, one way to think about it is if there was, a, let's say, an ocean with uh, no, no phytoplankton, um, then uh, what would happen compared to an ocean where there's phytoplankton now? And so the answer is that if, if there were no phytoplankton, then we estimate that the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere would be about 50% bigger than it is now, or about... Uh, about um, maybe twice as big as it was before humans intervened in the carbon cycle. So as we know, humans have intervened in the carbon cycle, we've increased carbon dioxide concentrations a lot, and as a result, uh, atmospheric CO2 is very high. So, um, but another way to think about them is to think about how, um, how, how important is the variability in ocean particles. So let's imagine we've got some particles that sink really deep into the ocean, and some other particles that sink, that go much, much, uh, much, much less deep into the ocean that sink to a very shallow depth. And it's estimated that the difference between these two can lead to atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, uh, um, regulating, uh, changing by about 150 parts per million. So that's pretty significant when you think that the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere today is about 400 parts per million. So not only do these particles matter, but also the sorts of particles matter quite a lot. So uh, we spend quite a lot of time going on ships, looking at particles, working at how big they are, working at how fast they sink, and thinking about this problem. How does the food web work? And so um, lots of things have control that, uh, how, what shape they are, how dense they are, how big they are. And uh, 
then uh, when they're sinking, how fast they dissolve. So we spend quite a lot of time measuring these things at sea. And I thought I'd show you a quick, um, a quick list, a quick experiment that we did at sea uh, just to work out how fast they sink. So here's four different particles. Uh, this one we could nearly see through under a microscope, so we call this a diffuse particle. This one we couldn't see through, so we called it a dense particle. This one has got a solid lump in the middle, and this one here is the same sort of solid lump, but it's got lots of spines sticking out of it. Um, so this one uh, is made of uh, calcium carbonate, that's uh, like chalk, so it's quite dense. Um, and this one is the same density, but it's got all this fluffy stuff around the outside. So we did an experiment to see how fast they sink, and this was the answer. So the, the slowest sinking one was, of course, the one that's diffuse because it's mainly water. The next fastest one was this dense particle. Um, but interestingly, the one after that was this organism because this organism has got lots of spikes on. And what we think is happening is these spikes are slowing it down and creating lots of friction um, uh, between the water and the particle, meaning it slows, sinks slowly. Whereas this centered particle sinks the fastest because it hasn't got this, it's got this goo caught up in all the spikes. So those are the sorts of things that regulate how fast particles sink. And um, because we're in a pub, uh, we thought we'd do some experiments to work out how fast particles sink that you find in pubs. So we're going to do some experiments. Uh, we're going to think about some particles, uh, some of the shape, the density, the size, and then we're going to predict the order of the sinking speed. Um, and you can put the answers in the chat. Uh, I'm going to do the experiments here in the lab um, or in the pub lab. Um, and you can time them at home, or if you're feeling really adventurous, you can do some experiments yourself. Um, and then we're going to uh, have a quick look and see what the answer is and uh, take it from there. So the sorts of particles that you find in a pub, in my experience, are the following. Here's some cola bottles. Uh, here's some walnuts. Here's a gherkin. Here's some olives, because it's quite a posh pub. And here's some uh, toothpicks, um, which you might be needing uh, 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 when you get home from the pub. So um, you can vote now on which of these you think is going to sink the fastest by um, going to this website, menti.com, and using this code. Uh, so I've put it on my Twitter account, um, or you can just copy it off the screen now. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that whilst I get set up with my, my experiments. So just very quickly, here we are. We've got some Haribo. Um, we've got some uh, walnuts. We've got some olives, and we've got some gherkins. So if you're ready to go, we can do the experiments now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in the measuring cylinder. Well, you can't see the measuring cylinder yet, but in a minute we're going to show you the measuring cylinder, and you can start looking at the, at the, 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 the particle experiments that happens, and um, you can make a note of how fast you think they sink. I'm going to do the same. And uh, if you want to make some comments, you can put them in the chat. And somebody has voted. Somebody else has voted. This is so exciting. Um, come on, I know there's 14 people out there, so you can all vote. Um, oh, somebody else has voted. So, uh, great. Um, let's, and why is nobody voting for a cola bottle? Right, let's go for it, and we're going to see what happens. So is it possible... Uh, backstage to put the measuring cylinder on. Oh, there it is. So here's the measuring cylinder. And there's my hand. So uh, what's the first one we're going to do? So the first one is the olive. So uh, I'm just going to get an olive out. Um, and so remember somebody, so who said, so somebody said they thought an olive would sink very quickly. So if you want to say why you think that's the case, then just say now. So here we go. This is the olive, and I'm just popping it in. Can you see it? So if you remember how fast that sinks, we can uh, we can put it somewhere on our results screen that I've got showing. And so there it goes. So I'm going to say that that one sinks um, quite slowly. So here we are. Here's our olive. Oh. And... Uh, there we are. So here's our results screen. 
there's an olive there. And so we're going to put the olive in the middle because we've only done one experiment, so we don't know. Right. So the next one I'm going to do is the cola bottle. So here's some cola bottles. And... Just what they're thinking is the slowest. I can't see the YouTube chat, so um, if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, communicate with me, then maybe you could put it in the YouTube chat, and then the people in the back screen can kind of put a message in the in the Streamyard chat so that I can see that. But anyway, here goes. Here's some um, they're gummy bears, actually, not cola bottles, and there we are. Now, what did you think? Did you think that's having fast or slow? So I think that fank sank faster than a gherkin, so than an olive, sorry. So I'm going to put that one there. And then I'm going to do the next one, which is a which is a gherkin. So gherkin, um, I think that one is going to sink quite slowly. Um, let's go for it. Here's a gherkin. So I would say that sank about the same as, a, as an olive, but we're going to uh, do another one just to make sure, because you should always replicate things in science. So there we are. I'm going to put that in the same sort of place. So there we are, kind of in the same sort of place. And then the next one I'm going to do is the walnut. So here's a walnut. And... Uh, Walnuts. So the thing I think, the thing I always think about walnuts is they're kind of quite, uh, they're not very smooth on the outside. They've got this sort of rigid structure, and that might slow them down in the same way as, uh, in the same way as we saw the particle earlier was slowed down because it had lots of spikes sticking out of it. So here we go. And can you see that? There we are. That's sinking really quite slowly, and the first one I put in isn't even sinking at all. So not every particle of a particular type sinks at the same speed. There's another one sinking really slowly. So that one we're going to put there. And then the final one uh, is the toothpick. So here's some toothpicks, um, and uh, everybody's, of course, concerned about microplastics in the oceans. So when you uh, throw toothpicks away, um, this is uh, some sort of indication of what happens to them. We're going to pop this into our pot of seawater and see what happens. So there it is. That's sinking really slowly too. We'll just make sure that it wasn't a fluke and do another one. So here we go. Did you see that? I've got one more toothpick left. I should have used a different color paper. There's our toothpick. There we are, we can see it sinking really slowly. So I'm gonna say that we move this one over here. These two are kind of about the same. The walnut goes there and the toothpick goes there. But do you agree? And did anybody get the same result in their um, in the thing? So let's go to min one was the gherkin. Uh, the cola bottle, which was indeed the fastest, uh, was very, not very well, um, was not very well, uh, not many people voted for that, um, but the olive was voted for by quite a lot of people as well. So um, what you've just done is uh, you've done an experiment. So you've uh, you've read the literature, so you've had a bit of a discussion about what makes things sink. You've looked at some other data that somebody else had. You've thought about, um, you've thought about what you're going to do when you do your experiment. You've made some predictions. You've gone into the lab. You've tested them. So as a result, you are now a scientist. Um, and what you've done is you've used what we call the scientific method, which is a really important thing that science does. Um, so in science, we, we look for evidence for things, um, and we don't, uh, we don't just say things. We kind of uh, think about them. We do experiments. We build theories. Um, so we think about a problem. We think about a key issue. We form some mental model of how the world works. We make some predictions. We test them. And then we draw some conclusions. And so the conclusions that I draw from this is that gummy bears uh, sink faster than pretty much anything else. Uh, 
The reason for that, I suspect, is because they're partly because they're streamlined, but also they're dense, uh, they're full of gelatin. Um, walnuts, incidentally, sink slowly because lots of nuts have oil in them, so they don't actually sink very quickly at all. Um, and then olives and gherkins sink kind of at medium speed because they're because they're they're full of water. So um, I'll just leave you with this. Um, what you've done is you've made a hypothesis, um, and hypotheses are really important in science because we make a theory using observations and logic. We test them with an experiment, um, and then we uh, we 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 um, we we consider that the theory is supported if we have some evidence to support it. But importantly, we can never get rid of the possibility that that, that theory is actually wrong. So however much evidence you get to support something, you're never quite sure. Somebody could always do an experiment sometime, somewhere, that suggests that your finely tuned theory that you've come up with is actually not true. So you can read more about uh, hypotheses if you want to um, in these websites. And I'm just going to conclude at this point. Uh, and um, here's some conclusions, because uh, we're doing science. So uh, all scientists end with a conclusion. Um, so ocean plants have the capacity to control our atmosphere and the greenhouse effect. So that's quite profound. So how ocean plants operate uh, can change what our atmosphere looks like. They can change our lifestyle. They can change the amount of insulation we have to put in our houses. They can change what the weather's like. They can uh, they can do all that. They can our whole climate is controlled at least in part by how plants grow and what they do. So how fast they sink regulates how big this effect is. Um, that's quite important too. It's not just any old plant, it's how plants interact with the environment they're in and how they're grazed and how copepods eat them. And so what that means is that uh, you could, in theory, change our atmosphere by actions in the ocean like, uh, like fishing. So if you fished a lot, you might catch some organisms that eat copepods. Copepods would uh, not be able to eat so many plants. And so we have what's called a trophic cascade taking place. So when we go to sea, we think about shape, size, density, and what I call edibility. So if you're a if you're a copepod and you want to eat a plant, um, if it's covered in glass, for example, you're not going to be able to eat it very easily. We can do simple experiments to see how this works. And uh, finally, um, I would say that science is based on hypotheses, but also having fun. Um, so you know, science is uh, great fun to do. Um, some of the best times of my life have been on ships, uh, having fun, doing science, understanding how the world works, but at the same time, uh, trying to help people uh, think about how their actions um, impact on what the planet is doing. And if you want to be an oceanographer, there are loads of opportunities. Um, uh, you can contact me at Ocean Ricks uh, on Twitter, but there's also um, loads and loads of resources online if you want to become an oceanographer. And I would encourage you to consider it as a career because uh, it's uh, been great for me and it's fantastic fun. And understanding how the natural world works is tremendously rewarding for me. So I'll just stop there and thank you for your attention and take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. <laughs> Uh, thank you for giving us the basics of scientific method and I'm uh, sure that many people are now curious and can't wait to try this experiment uh, when the pubs are finally open <laughs> or set up the labs at their home. Um, I have a question about the gummy bears, so the winner of the experiment that you just performed. Uh, do you think that the color of the gummy bears would possibly affect the sinking speed? Can you say that again, please? Oh. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if the color could possibly affect the density of the gummy bears, leading to a different speed of sinking. I'd be surprised, but it's not impossible. Okay. <laughs> but I but suspect the colour means... would affect the edibility of a particle. So, um, so, uh, so if you're a, if it, so, if you're a, so one of the interesting things is that uh, lots of organisms 
uh, hunt in the ocean or some hunt by uh, feeling feeling motion like the first speaker described but others hunt by looking and uh, different sorts of light go into the ocean at different rates so some 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 wavelengths get absorbed very quickly and some wavelengths don't get absorbed very quickly so you could imagine that if you're a particular color of organism you might actually be more or less visible to things that are are looking for you so i'm not sure that color is going to regulate how fast you sink but color might regulate whether you get eaten or not that is probably right and uh just to repeat uh, these ocean plants uh, or phytoplankton uh do they reach the depth of uh, organisms that joanna uh, was talking about before so, so when they sit so phytoplankton only really grow in the surface because they need light to grow um and so uh, in the interior of the ocean right at the bottom there's no light so these organisms are swimming around in the surface ocean growing there um but in order to take carbon into the ocean and store it there, they need to get down. Now, some of them sink the way that we just looked at, but some of them um, are taken down by copepods that Joanna described, eating them at the surface and swimming down. And that process that Joanna described called DL vertical migration is really important for uh, taking particles very rapidly from the surface down to the, uh, the four or 500 meters, because that's, um, that migration of copepods up and down on a daily basis is the single largest movement of organisms uh, that takes place anywhere on the, in the world. Oh. So uh, the interaction between phytoplankton and the organisms that eat them, the copepods, is absolutely crucial for regulating what our climate looks like. Well, there you go, folks, copepod striking again. Uh, we have a comment from uh, YouTube, and uh, it's a question from Kurt. In the long run, wouldn't the toothpick sink the deepest since all others would be eaten on their way? That's, um, that's a really good question. Um, certainly microplastics have been found um, in deep ocean sediments. I think microplastics are now pervasive uh, everywhere in the planet. You know, you're eating them, you're excreting them, uh, they're everywhere. What I think we don't know is what you're talking about how degraded they get in the environment um my suspicion is that if you put microplastics into the surface ocean then they get to the bottom very very effectively um but i'm not sure that we have exactly enough data yet to really be convinced of that um the very small plastics that you that you find in cosmetics or you used to find in cosmetics i think might get degraded by sunlight in the surface ocean. But the very big ones like that uh, toothpick that I showed you, I'm sure that will get to the bottom very nearly, um, very nearly undisturbed. So uh, yeah, plastic pollution is everywhere. That is a sad note to finish this with, <laughs> but very important one to remind ourselves, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, for doing experiments with us and bringing science to our homes. Uh, you can reach Richard on his social media and we will post the link uh, on the agenda of tonight to the YouTube chat. And now you can join me for the final quiz of tonight. So you will finally get a chance to get some Pint of Science goodies uh, as a prize if you dare. And let me just begin by sharing our game with you. If you are still watching us and if you have more questions for our speakers, you can post them in the YouTube chat in the meantime and they will be able to reply. And here is our Kahoot for the final quiz of the night. So um, the procedure is the same as in the beginning. You either go to the website kahoot.it or you download the, the app on your phone and you type in the code that you see on your screen. It's 4925669. Looks like we have a first player and we are teaming up. 
Come on, people. Let's see if we have a winner of the night who can remember some trivia facts from the talks that we just listened to. And people are still joining. There are quite many speakers, sorry, uh, quite many uh, viewers on YouTube and we can see you. So you may as well join our Kahoot and join the competition for Pint of Science goodies. And we can start the game, I think. So prepare yourselves for quiz of the night. And first question is a multi-select one. Are you really ready for the quiz of the night? There's no time to lose here if you want to win. Grab your phones, click on your browser and join the game. Nine seconds left. Let's see if you have been paying attention or if you have been busy with your pizza and drinks. Looks like most of the people were listening and are ready to join in the game or they're really craving some kind of science goodies. So let them enter the competition and with the Katarina leading the chart, let's move on. Second question. In a typical ice core, the layers are, are they older, the deeper you drill into the ice, younger, the deeper you drill, or are they all of the same age, or there are no layers at all? What do you think? Does the ice get older, the deeper we go? Is it younger? Is it the same age? It's older the deeper we drill into the ice and seems like almost most of you almost all of you got that correct with Katarina still leading the board next one if the whole Greenland ice sheet melts global mean sea level will rise by one centimeter one meter seven meters or 10 meters. People are answering and we have 12, 11, almost, yeah, all of us answered. And you remember this fact from Petra's talk. Very good. Next question. Katarina still leading the board. What is the name of a copepod larval form? Is it a bipinaria larva, tadpole, pilidium, or nucleus? If you remember, they don't look the same, and there is one form when they are really young that we call. This answer will be revealed in three, two, one. It's nucleus, and all of you got that right except for someone who really likes pilidium larva. And Katarina is followed by Henry. Maybe he will reach the first spot with the final, almost final question. What is the biomass ratio of copepods and humans on Earth? So are there more copepod uh, biomass or human biomass is way bigger? on our planet. What do you think? Is it the equal ratio or are there 15 times more copepods or are there 15 times more humans or is it 150 more times copepods to humans on earth? And the answer is quite shocking. There are 150 times more copepods on earth than humans. And most of you got that right. 
And it looks like we have a winner of our first quiz of the night. And it's Katarina. Congratulations, Katarina. Don't forget to give us uh, your email. We will contact you with, uh, with our prize and how to claim it. I hope all of you enjoyed tonight. And uh, let me bring back all the speakers from tonight for a final goodbye. And please join me in welcome. Yes, in welcoming back, welcoming them back on stage. Thank you all of you for uh, joining us tonight and thank you for introducing us to your science. Thank, thank you, you. Jessica, thank you, Joanna, and thank you, Richard. Big applause virtually. And thank you for watching us today. Don't forget to join us tomorrow at the same time, 6 p.m. Broadcasted from Bergen to you by Pint of Science. See you. Bye. Bye.